Let's get this party started. It's director's commentary time again. I'm a teetotaler tonight. Cheers. So this particular episode, the Utah Canyonlands, is, uh, it wasn't really my problem child episode, but it definitely became a, a, an episode of controversy. There was, at one point, there was this whole big sort of conspiracy search into uh, whether or not I cheated the show and the stuff, that, stuff was left behind and, well, he wasn't even really out there kind of, it was all a bunch of, which was a bunch of nonsense and I'll talk about that now. But uh, you know what, I, there's a good story to tell about that, but let's get into it first and when I'm inspired, we'll, we'll get into it. Here we go. <laughs> Today on Survivor Man, I'm in southern Utah, and it's among the most mysterious and unexplored regions of the American Southwest. Ancient cultures have survived here and vanished in the breathtaking but brutal canyon land. And I'm going in for seven days alone. Let's stop it right there and talk about that narration tone, shall we? So you have to understand, let's go back in time. I mean, when I was filming this, it was 2002, I believe. Uh, maybe three. No, no two. Well, it was early because so this is 2002. And, uh, you know, by the time I got into the edit suite and, and, and we're doing the narration and voiceover and everything for it, uh, I think something I want to refer back to a lot for this particular director's commentary and this, or this particular episode, shall we say, this location, was that let's place everything in context. It was season one of Survivor Man. I'd done my pilots. They were a success. Now I'm filming for the first time ever Survivor Man as a season around the world. So I was very new, very green, and had a lot to learn about production. I mean, I'd been on production and in production for a, a lot of years, but this was the first time I was absolutely in charge. So I had a lot to learn, and, and I also had to figure out my own voice. When it comes to this narration, you know, it was the excitement of the time. It was my first time narrating an entire series, and I was trying to be all sort of, uh, not overly dramatic, but definitely keep you in the context of this is a real challenge. But that also was something that the networks were, would always be pushing for. Like, well, you got to show the challenges, got to say the stakes. And even they wanted me to, yeah, let's not get into it. All right, we'll get into it. Even when there weren't serious stakes, they wanted me to play up whatever was minimal to be maximum, which you can. It's mountains out of molehills, right? <clears throat> so I never did it. I hated, I hated all of that. Um, but. I did allow my voiceover working with myself, going, all right, this time on, on, on Survivor Man, we're in the Utah Canyonlands. And, and so I was just finding my voice. That's the end of that story. Awesome. Massive country. The ancient magic in these canyons is legendary. I'm in for the ride of my life. So this was, you know, um, as I mentioned in other director's commentaries, this was before drones. So there were no drones to use. So everything had to be, anything aerial had to be done by, uh, by helicopter. My crew will drop me in, and the local scout, Desert Dave, We'll be camped out many miles away until I get back. I hate this part! No water, predatory mountain lions, nighttime chills, disease-carrying insects, loneliness and despair. These are the dangers and challenges of the Southwest Canyons. This is winter. Uh, I was going to stop it there. It's like, so you hear what I'm doing there, right? I'm summarizing all of the challenges and dangers. A lot of times I... Honestly, I kind of didn't like doing that. It's like, oh, dangerous mountain lions and disease-bearing mosquitoes. Yeah, okay, there are mosquitoes that in different places have dengue fever or malaria, this and that. But making it so dramatic was part and parcel of learning how to get my voice for this series and appeasing network executives' desire for drama. 
but as you guys know, if you watch my stuff, I'll, a lot of times I play the drama down because it, it should be played down. It's not as bad as what so many uh, you know, network executives and television producers want you to think. Um, but I want to talk about the crew there. So in a bit, in a bit, because this crew is amazing. David Holliday, uh, Stavros Stavridis, I think is his name, uh, Glenn Crawford. I gotta, I gotta, I'll talk about these guys in a minute. In one of the most remote canyon lands of the American Southwest. Ah, it's no wonder Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch chose these remote parts to hide out from the law. But for now, it's just me, my camera, my horse. For the next seven days, alone. Dave knows a lot about surviving out here, but he's not telling me everything. I think people get kind of psychologically spooked out by some of the amazing energy that runs around these canyons. A lot of people that have come here and vanished, there's something happening here that's not like what he's used to. So I should pause that right there. So David Holliday. For those of us in survival and all my survival cronies and friends and other teachers, he's legendary. He's a hero to us. He's an awesome dude and we all love him and he's more knowledgeable than most of us put together. Um, certainly when it comes to desert survival. Uh, his experience is, is unsurpassed. Uh, and there's a big story behind David and I, because I brought him on board, because I, I respected him so much, to be my consultant for Survivor Man. And he was, for a, a number of episodes, the Arizona episode, he was a consultant. This episode, he was a consultant. I'm not sure if there's probably, yeah, there was a few more. And he had already been involved, I believe, with Castaway, with Tom Hanks, uh, as an advisor there. That's correct, yeah. And then, and then it was me. Uh, after people saw his name on my credits, he became a desired commodity for the film world. And, he would, and a lot of companies would, re would reach out to him, including the company that would eventually go on, well, after this, to create a show called Man vs. Wild, which I'll, I'll allude to later, um, David, David's involvement in that show, which he will go on record and say to this day he deeply regrets. Uh, but not my show. We stayed friends, and he is a phenomenal. So if you're looking for great survival instruction, and you're down in the desert area, Boulder, uh, Boulder, Utah, uh, Arizona, any of that, just look up David Halliday, best one of the best teachers on the planet. Uh, but so I had this whole crew with me. Now, when you're looking at this edit here, uh, again, season one, we were getting the feel of how we should present this show. So in this situation, it was show me going into the survival locations. I would always liked that. Later on, as time went on, it just became this thing where it was just like, Les, we just want to see you in the jungle. No more airplane rides, no more instructors per, you know, comments on where you're going, no more Jeep rides, nothing. Let's start with you just in the jungle or in the Arctic or wherever, which is fine. I get it. There was enough content for that, not a problem. But I have to say, I enjoyed showing my learning process into this. Uh, I mean, David and I spent, you know, a week together out in Arizona on the land learning before I went off and did the Arizona episode. So, and we spent some time here too, looking up, uh, looking at the different plants and walking around and training. I missed, I missed, I like, I wanted to show all that in the series, but I lost that argument, I guess. Well, I'm on my own now. Time to check out my surroundings, I guess. Oh, important point to make there. Well, I'm on my own now. You know why I said that? Because I wanted to make sure that the audience was aware that to get up to this point, let's face it, there were multiple camera angles, weren't there? That was not me setting up my camera and riding through the Utah Canyon lands trying to fit. No, no, of course I had a camera person there. But again, trying to get my feel for how to produce this series, all right, I'll go there now. This is how this crew sort of became involved. I was working with my good friend and, and producer partner, Dave Brady, but it was season one. So everybody was all about, well, Les, you need to have a field producer. We need a writer out there with you. You know, you've got your expert person, like the David Hallidays of this world. We, you gotta have a crew. This is f and so the people I was working with, well, mostly Dave, and then also the networks, it's like they wanted to see the face of a professional film shoot. But for me, all of that betrayed what I was really trying to do. It's just leave me alone out there to do my thing, to teach survival skills. And let 
you know, the Max Atwoods of this world, they can go back and get the beauty shots, the B-rolls of the birds flying and the, and the, and the, and the time-lapse, the weather time-lapse and so on. But this Utah episode was in a way the worst for me in terms of too many people. Now, were they with me at this point? No, they were gone. But all that opening scenery, that was all the wonderful work of Glenn Crawford. Um, which makes for an exciting opening. So in many ways, I didn't mind the opening part of it, but it still seemed like a lot of people to hang around for another seven days after we shot the opening. And later on, of course, I would, I would stop that altogether. Here we go. This is some pretty amazing biking country. I figure if I had to, really, I could probably bike out of here in about three days. But hey, this is a survival show. So, the stab into the tire. Of course, I got would see posts about that. That was the stupidest thing to do ever. It's like, dude, I'm making a survival show. And there's something that people seem to miss. I don't know why. But, well, I guess if they're not paying attention, most of you get it. It's that I still needed to create a scenario, right? A survival scenario that I could play off of and show different things. So I thought, hey, how about a mountain bike? People mountain bike in Utah. How about I have a mountain bike with me? Let's see what I can do with it. Well, I didn't actually have a flat, so let's make it flat. Let's make it so I can't ride out on this thing. And so I'm always, in, in, in Survivor Man, I was always creating a scenario. I always like to say, for example, getting stuck in a car in the snow happens to people, so I did that in Norway. I, I love doing that. I actually love creating, up the, creating the scenarios. This one was okay. Um, in hindsight, what I should have done was actually set myself up dressed as a mountain biker, having what mountain bikers would actually have. That's how I would redo this one, is to be fully decked out, because I, I mountain bike, I ride, and I do biking tours, so I'd be decked out that way and not have my other type clothing. Like shooting your own horse to eat, I'll cannibalize the bike to survive. Let's make it a week. Yeah, I do have a pack full of gear. It's all my camera gear and clothing. They left it for me. Again, you know, just I just like to explain when I'm doing my shooting and that I like to make sure people, well, hey, wait a minute, where, where, where'd that backpack come from? The crew left it for me because it's got all my camera gear in it. No camera gear and no show, so. Gosh, that's beautiful. It's incredibly. Stop that right there. This is a note to Luke, who's editing this director's commentary for you right now. Hey, Luke, for when you see these lower thirds on the left side of the screen, right where I am right now, okay, take me right now, move me over to the right, just for this moment so people can see the lower third. Got that, Luke? And then after the lower third, if you want to move me back, you can move me back. Be quiet here. Too quiet. Like you could move me back right now. I don't really know how much sunlight I have left. Oh, let me tell you. One, two, three and a half hand widths. So that's about three and a half hours. I better find a place to settle down. Well, this juniper tree behind me is going to make some pretty good shelter for me. But first, I want to get a big fire going. I figure if it does snow tonight, at least if I have a big fire going, you know, I can maybe make it through the night. I'm up, raised up here, and there's a drainage that kind of curves and goes around here. I'd have to get a real downpour for it to come up this high or even a little higher up there. So. Anyway, now I gotta get all my fire making stuff. Ah, the juniper tree shelter. So this, let's go to the controversy. This was one of the points of the con controversy of Les's, you know, Survivor Man's Utah Canyonlands episode. You know, he was cheating. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, the reality is I was not very far from a road. But I've had that reality in several Survivor Man's. In the Georgia swamps, I could hear trucks shifting down their gears. Now, I was still, 
uh, you know, surrounded by swamps, so it would have been difficult to get to them. But just the same, I could hear the road. Uh, I've had times when I've been able to, in Costa Rica, I could see across the ocean at a resort. Um, I've had places where, times where I could spot, spot the odd dwelling long ways away. So yeah, I wasn't that far from a road, but so what? In this situation, unlike other shows you might have seen, it wasn't like I was shooting the scene, hopping in a truck and going to the hotel. I was shooting the scene and staying out there. So I don't know what I was, maybe a half a kilometer from the road, something like that. Not very far. So yeah, I could have walked out, but as I said, in a lot of Survivor Man's, uh, uh, not all of them obviously, maybe a third of them, I could walk out or paddle out or what have you. Uh, but the point was I wasn't going to. I was going to stick with it and go through the ordeal and film it all. So, so I was apparently called out on that, but that's the reality. It's like, yep, it was not that far from a road like other times. But the other thing they called me out on, which was... Uh, absolutely uh, true in this case, and I was really ticked off about it. But this shelter and the one coming up, uh, well, keep watching. I'll explain when we get there. It may not look like it, but snowstorms blanketed these canyons just before I got here, baked by the sun in the day and frozen solid at night. At least there's plenty of firewood. Can you hear the jetway up there? Right now, those people are eating lobster. The temperatures in these parts are wild, swinging to huge extremes in a matter of hours. Oh, this is good stuff. Really good stuff. My biggest fear, can my body adjust? Fire starter and bedding. I'm going to make a long fire that I can feed from one end. Then I don't have to worry about trying to break logs small. And I'm actually going to line this thing with rocks because the sand is actually pretty damp. Now, that's actually a great survival technique I love teaching. Uh, long, small fires rather than small, high fires. Uh, you can lie beside them, uh, but the big point in that, or the main point in that, is that uh, without a saw, it's very difficult to cut firewood uh, down to size for your, for your fire pit and much easier to burn logs. By the way, the, a great technique at that that I, I love and I've used for years is if, let's say you have three long logs. You put two coming in from one end, okay, and, uh, and then one coming in from the other end and they, you put them like that, right, so they'd be laying flat, right? So they're interconnected like that, right? And this middle area is the fire. What happens is, as they burn, they burn, 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 and then, and then they're at that point where they're going to go out or whatever. You just, from either end, shove them back in again, even more, and then they burn, burn, burn down, shove in, burn, burn, burn down, shove in. It's a great way with three logs to keep a fire going, but without the fire getting away on you. The reason why I do that is if I put three logs together, then the fire becomes big, in the three logs and then just eats down the logs and will burn right out your shelter. So this is a really great technique. It's a little incidental survival information on our director's commentary here. Survival means multitasking and getting it done without breaking a sweat. If I sweat, the cold nights will be hard to handle. Oh yeah? The famous, you sweat, you die. The, the, by the way, that, that line, you, you sweat, you die. Well, I do take credit for it. Uh, but I also owe credit to uh, Craig Lawrence, a dog sled, a friend of mine in, from Tomogamy, Ontario. We used to run dogs together. And he owned dogs. And, and uh, I was running dogs for other companies and, and guiding trips. And we both used to just say that all the time. When we're out in the winter woods or whenever you're in a cold situation, you sweat, you die. The whole point there, if you've ever been wondering what that's all about, well, just go out and get yourself nice and sweaty at 2 p.m. on a winter's day and not be able to change your clothes and have to make a shelter that night. You're soaking wet by 4.30, you're going to freeze. So that is why staying dry close to your skin is absolutely vital, vital and, and life-saving in a cold weather situation. I've still got maybe two hours of sunlight left. Work on my shelter.
By the way, that's why I'm wearing that black shirt. It's one of those wicking materials. Back then, it was like the beginning of that stuff. Oh, it's got a wicking factor. I remember when that was brand new. And the point being that I'm not going to wear cotton. I stay away from cotton when it cut my, there, that's my survival advice. Do not wear cotton close to your skin in any survival situation, really in any adventure and tripping situation. I know cotton's comfortable, but when, once it's wet, it stays wet. This uh, ridge pole was a little bit lower than I wanted, so I dug a hole down a bit and then lined it with some uh, juniper bark and uh, this grass just to braise me up and it keeps me off the cold sand. And then I covered all of these branches and sticks in the, over top to protect me a bit, reflect some of the heat back once I do get a fire going. Uh, but this is about as much work as I want to do tonight before I get too sweaty. Sun's almost behind the mountains. So, another technique. Ah, I feel, I'm, I'm in the mood to keep giving you survival techniques while we do this director's commentary. Uh, that whole thing about keeping yourself up off the ground in any survival situation, so extremely important. If you've got a thermo rest, you know, the air mattresses, the type, type pads, sleeping pads, you're gold. Great, you're good to go. But if you don't, just being on the ground, it doesn't matter how big your fire is. It doesn't matter how thick and strong your shelter is you're going to freeze. You've got to get up off the ground. That's number one. When I build my shelters, I usually build them bed first. So you're doing, if you're doing any shelters out there in the woods, build your bed first. Lie on it. Make sure it's big enough. Make sure it's thick enough. Then build your roof and everything over top of it, not the other way around. And yeah, that's just incredibly important. And every survival instructor will say, man, protect yourself from the ground at, a, at any cost. <laughs> Every time I come out and try survival in a new location, I like to test some kind of survival item just to see how it works. This time around, I'm gonna try this little item, magnesium flint stick. Okay, so, couple things. Some uh, full disclosure moment, a full disclosure moment, and then a, but a, a comment before that. You saw me sort of sitting in the sun. That was something I did do on a lot of Survivor Man episodes. I would always take uh, some meditative time. I had the opportunity. Now, I did have a lot of stuff to film. I mean, it, it's just go, go, go filming myself. But, uh, but I also took the time to meditate and become part of the area I was in. And, and over the years, I even got, I got much more conscious of that and better at it because I just remembered. Is it, you know, that matter of giving gratitude and things like that uh, became very important for me. And not, it wasn't just going to all be about skills. Now, the full disclosure part, uh, pfft, yeah, I'm used a flint stri striker like that for many years. So I, I knew what I was doing uh, in this situation. But this was the birth of the idea of why don't I always grab something off the shelf from a survival section in a store and just see what happens, see how good it is, see what I can do with it. I, all, I love doing that because it was, you know, this, this striker I know I like a lot and I could prove it out. Um, but for example, those little uh, saws that they, they, sell, they sell to, you know, to cut through logs. They're pieces of crap. They're all pieces of crap. There's one big strong one that's made out of a chainsaw blade that's good, but the rest of them that you buy in the stores, don't buy them. Do not buy those little saws, and, and, this, and it's just wasted uh, material in any little survival kit. But I digress. Don't buy a survival kit from a store that's made ready to go, ever. Make your own. And if you want to see my breakdown on survival kits, check the playlist here on YouTube. I do, I just, just put in, search in me and just go uh, survival kit and you'll see it. And I do like a long talk and I take, pull apart all these survival kits. So that's right here. And the other point of uh, my little interruption here is to say that if you want to see this episode in its entirety without all these interruptions, then uh, it's here. Just go in the playlist. Here's what the playlist looks like. Okay, so that's what the playlist look like, looks like. You just click on playlist and search for season one or director's commentaries or, or master class and uh, go in there and find the uh, stuff on survival kits or find this episode in its entirety. All right, let's keep watching. What I want to do 
to shave off this magnesium, I need to make a little pile. You gotta be real patient. When I say really patient, I mean really patient. It takes a long time to get that pile of shavings. So if, if you pick up one of these little uh, magnesium striker flint sticks, which I do, I like these ones, and you're gonna try the magnesium part of this, take your time and get a really good pile. Well, that's not a bad pile. We'll see. I just don't know. Magnesium. This isn't easy to do uh, in the wind. Really hard. A key thing here, protect yourself from the wind uh, big time or it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail on you. Baby burn. Burning meat. Whoa. But that little magnesium stick is definitely a winner in my book. Hey. <laughs> under this juniper tree because it is chilling down really quickly as soon as that sun disappeared. So I guess I should show you what I have to survive with for the week. Before I do, what I'll say is there's always a slight degree of warmth underneath a tree than out and away from a tree, especially in the desert. Mesquite trees, juniper trees, you get under them and they can be, you know, three degrees to six degrees to eight degrees warmer than if you step away from them. And that matters a lot in a survival situation. Always, of course, my multi-tool. You've already met Mr. Magnesium Flint Stick. And last, not least, I've got some food. Well, look at this, an old shriveled up piece of energy bar. Mmm, and some corn chips. Wow, I'd say that's about enough to last a week, wouldn't you? So now the idea behind this was, it was a little bit of a convoluted idea that, that uh, worked in some episodes, didn't work in others, but the, uh, the concept was, let's send me in with some stuff, anything, just to see, you know, okay, well, what can I do with that, you know? And in this case, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think I had David Halliday, I think I said, just put some stuff together, you know, a little bit in a, in a, in a thing for me. And so it's like a, a surprise, like, okay, that's what I've got. Now, the reason for doing that, by the way, is because in any survival situation, whether you're biking or boating or hiking or whatever, you are stuck in that situation with whatever you brought in. And a lot of times you, you did not come in prepared. And so I was, again, creating a scenario so that I would have stuff that I could just play off of and say, well, okay, I got, this is random, but let's see what I can do with it. Well, there's snow up in the mountains and just a few miles from here, devastating flash floods, wiping out everything in sight. And I hear that bobcats and mountain lions come down into these valleys at times like these, searching for food, easy food sleeping food. Okay, I'm just being cute there. Hey, one a quick story. Oh, you know what? Here, I'm going to rewind it just a little bit. Hang on. Uh, uh, rewind. Uh, 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 and like that and stop. There we go. Just freeze it on that logo there. A uh, little story about that logo. Because it's a pretty cool design, I always thought. That little man in the middle there. So it's funny. I saw it on someone else's logo and I liked it. And then, of course, and it was actually on Laura Bombier's logo. She was my um, photographer. 
not in this season, but uh, season two, I believe. Yeah, I can't remember which episode she came in on, but uh, maybe it was this season. But anyway, she was my photographer for many years, and she had this logo with her work. If you look up creativegood.ca, I guess, or creativegood.com, that's her Instagram and that. Uh, maybe find her website. You, you'll see her logo, and you'll see a similar. Say, yeah, it looks like the same little guy in the Survivor Man logo. But she couldn't claim it on me because it's clip art. That's all that little man is. It was clip art, just like legal clip art that you could get. And so then we designed the O and the compass thing and the Survivor Man across. I mean, actually, that logo went through a lot of uh, uh, rejigging before we landed on it the way the way I liked it uh, and the way I wanted it to be. And here it is sort of thing. But yeah, so you never know when stuff is coming from. Actually, now that I think of it, our Wild Harvest logo, also some clip art. You know, So it's legal and licensed and all that. Um, and we just take a bit of clip art and just adjusted it a bit. Uh, I was getting, trying to get artists to create a Survivor Man logo for me and logo for me, and none of them were winning. It's just like, eh, it doesn't look stupid. Then I came up with this idea. Who knew? That was one frosty night. Ground's all frozen now and frosted over. Really, it was just a matter of sleep a half hour, wake up, feed the fire. Sleep a half hour, wake up, feed the fire. See, this is what I regret about my clothing. I kind of regret that I have all this clothing. I wish I'd done a mountain biking episode where I went in with mountain biking clothing on and whatever I might have in a mountain biking little kit, notwithstanding the camera gear that I need. I think it would have been, uh, I just think it would have been cooler. Um, if I were to redo this, that's how I would do it. And, and in the future, I did do stuff like that a little more, a little more closer to um, what you would expect a person to have in a certain scenario. All right. All right. And just pray for morning. I don't believe it. I can't find any water in this area at all. And yet, there's a creek down in the canyon cut. But guess what? I can't get to it. Because everywhere I look, it's like a 30 foot drop and I can get down in there, but I'd never get back out again. Have a look. See what I mean? Well, how frustrating is that? A beautiful canyon cut, a flowing creek, and I can't get to it. That's called getting ledged up in cowboy terms. Come to a spot like this, you get down, you can never get out again. You can't get to the water, you die of dehydration. And at the moment, I'm ledged up. That is a very true moment there. I, I totally, you know, knowing, knowing the topography, I knew there were creeks in the area. I thought, oh, it's going to be great. Go down and get some fresh water. But nope, there was no way. I could have walked for miles, and I could not find a way down that rock wall to where the water was where I could also get back up again. I mean, I probably could have gotten down in a few situations, wouldn't have been able to get back up again. So very frustrating. I didn't even know that existed. And that was one of the things I loved about Survivor Man so much, was getting in a place and then my own learning taking place and learning what ledged up means and seeing that you could be so close to water and yet unable to get to it. I suppose if you're traveling, you could commit to going down, but, but there were big drops. I mean, I risked snapping my ankle trying to get down there. This is all the water I can find in this whole slick rock area. All it is is a little bit of frost melt. Uh, you might be wondering about, well, are there going to be parasites and this and that? You know, in a survival situation and fresh melt water from frost melt and then snow melt, that sort of thing, nah, you know, I mean, yes, there's bacteria. Yeah, there's probably mineral components. Uh, you know, honestly, some of that stuff might give you diarrhea or, you know, make you feel a little off, but dehydration's a killer. So getting the liquid into you is always vital and important. And you can probably deal with the side effects of that water later and it not be that as big of an issue as if you were, if, as if you had become hypothermic. When Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch came through here, they sometimes had to shoot a horse just to eat. It's time to retire my trusty horse. The parts on this bike could save my life. <laughs> 
So what's the idea here? The idea really that I was kind of hammering home again and again and again in different survivor man situations was if you need to, you can cannibalize stuff that is around you. You can repurpose. That's the best word. Repurpose something you have. Actually, that's very important in a survival situation. If you have to make the sacrifice, but it repurposes something into something from what it is into something better, enabling you to survive, then you do it. You make the sacrifice. And that's really the short moral of this long story. I shivered through last night because my shelter was thrown together so quickly to beat nightfall. I'm hustling now to insulate it, and the bike frame makes a great supporting wall. Try not to take too much to hurt the tree. It exposes them to bugs. Out of respect for the environment, I took this bark from several trees. I think in time I could probably maybe even weave a really nice bed out of this, but for now, I think just pulling it in loose like this keeps it lofty probably good insulation as a result so you know that was a line that i often said in varying survivor man episodes was something about the environment or my care for it or whatever i mean let's face it in the end what was i really doing i was making a film about survival now i was always a, a, a kind of walking a, a fine line there and and of mix of a mixed mind about it because on one hand I want to teach you actual skills you can actually use, and so I had to actually do things to show you, oh, you could kill and eat this animal, or you know, hack down this tree, or the, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, I also realized that I was just making a film about survival, so now I, I kind of, you know, I would feel kind of a little guilty, a little bad about, okay, well, I'm gonna destroy these trees over here, or destroy all those plants, or kill that animal. Uh, when I, you know, I could just go home and not, not make these films. I could do something else for a living. Uh, but I was always of a mixed mind. So that's why I thought, well, at, at the very least in the narration, I would at least mention my respect for the trees, the plants, the wildlife, the environment, uh, even though I was doing damage to it to show and teach survival skills. This temperature can be deceiving. I'm tempted just to kind of kick around in the sun. That could be the death of me. It can go well below freezing in just a few hours. This shelter can never be insulated enough, it can never have enough firewood. See that? Look. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, the beauty fades fast especially when you're cold and alone. A general rule that survivors use to gauge the odds of survival is called the five W's. Wood. Well, there's plenty of wood for burning and for shelter. Weather. Weather's pretty good right now. If it did turn bad, there's places that I can get in and protect myself. Widowmakers. Well, there's nothing tall, standing and dead that's gonna come crashing down on me in the middle of the night and kill me. Wigglies. Scorpions, spiders, snakes, they're all buried deep in the ground this time of year. I don't have to worry about them. But water. Well, water. There's none of it. Full credit to David Halliday for the five W's. Without a good supply of water, I may have to move on at daybreak. Off to bed. Feel a lot better with a shelter like this now, I'll tell you. All closed over and hopefully warmer thanks to this juniper bark in the fireplace. Good night. Getting hungry. You know, the moral of that story is when you do a survival shelter, you, if you're there long term, you must always be adding to it every day. Add, add, add. 
make it warmer, increase the insulation, make the bed better, close off a drafty spot, uh, all of that. You just constantly upgrade your shelter in any long-term survival situation. It's too bad I have to leave. The shelter is just right, but I need a drink and this place is dry. The strapping from inside the bike tire is perfect to bundle up this juniper bark. And the bark is great insulation and way too valuable to leave behind. The crew will have to fly in later to clean up the site. Ha! Ah, all right, let's address that right now. Here's the problem with that. The crew didn't go back in. It was just a situation where I had expected they would go back and clean up for me um, because that was part of our deal was, okay, here's where I was, yada, yada. And uh, so go back in and, you know, and in a situation like that, cleaning up would mean dispersing stuff, spreading it around, kind of putting it back sort of where, from whence it came. Uh, back to the land sort of thing because in, in all situations and you know most survival if not all survival shelters that I've ever built they just meld back into the ground once you, especially if you destroy them in some cases like in the boreal forest you could just leave them they're just going to end up melting into the ground uh, because there's no man-made materials it's just you know repurposed uh, moved around logs and rocks uh, but my guys never went back and, uh, and I didn't know that I actually didn't know that until that whole controversial post was done where some guy was saying, oh, Stroud's cheating. It's like, you know, and he left, he looked at the mess he left and it's like, man, part of me was like, yeah, you're right. It's like, but pff, those guys are supposed to go in and clean it up. So, yeah, I'm just sort of pointing the finger. I get it. But, but um, I should have made sure in the end. But again, I was still learning. I was still learning what, it, learning what it was to be an executive producer, learning what it was to be fully in charge of a, of a film production. And uh, it was a drop ball. Um, and uh, eventually it was cleaned up, but not right after, not for a while. This is an amazing sight. You guys see what I'm looking at here. I'm thinking down there is water. Big canyon like that's got to be a flowing creek. And uh, water is what I need. So I'm going to take the chance on it. Find a way down. All right, here we go. Here's the time for the full disclosure. So this, it, through the whole process, I think I've done, I don't know, maybe 60 Survivor Man episodes, uh, maybe 70, I can't remember now. And in the whole run of all of that, there were two locations where I wanted to show the story of the environment. Uh, and then I got to those locations, so this is one of them. And I get there and say, oh, this is a great area. And then, oh, that's, and I'm location scouting, right? I'm looking around. Then I found this other area. And the problem was there was, I think, like 50, 50 miles between them. There's no way I was going from one to the other on foot. That wasn't going to happen, not while carrying all this gear and filming. And again, not taking the responsibility away from me, but I was still learning. Season one, wasn't sure what to do. And so I was working a lot with Dave Brady. And in this situation, we brought on board, uh, I think his name was Stavros Stavrids. It'll be in the, in the credits. Wonderful man, an amazing writer, a, a great, uh, you know, uh, he worked in film and he, he was a writer, basically. Uh, David Halliday was there. David's wife was actually also uh, there. They weren't here with me. Uh, through all everything we've been watching thus far. But what ended up happening was we're sitting around, we're thinking about how to do this, where to put less, and then, of course, it was put on the table. Well, why don't we just get you from one place and move you to the other? And this was a moment where I said, oh, come on, man, like that's going to, it's going to throw off my rhythm. It's, it's interruptive. But I see the point because I want to show both locations. All right. So I said, listen, all right, if we're going to do this, fine. But you have to grab me and get me there immediately. I don't want any food in the car. I don't want to smell food on you guys. I mean, legitimately, I don't even want to smell food on you guys. I don't want water to be available to me. You got to pick me up. You got to drop me off at the second location and get out of my way and let me get back into it. I did that only twice 
in all the years of doing Survivor Man, and this was one of them. So to get from that last episode, uh, last location to this location was 50 miles. The guys had picked me up. They honored my words. They didn't have any food on them. They didn't have any water. They just, uh, they, I climbed into the, <coughs> the back seat of the truck, threw my gear in the back of the truck. We, you know, chit-chatted a bit on the way to here, and they opened up the door and let me out, and now I was coming to this area. Now, this area has trails leading down into it, and I knew that. So that's what I'm looking for right now is to find the trail so I can get, make my way down into the, um, down into this canyon. That's where the controversy came in because I think somebody had checked the location and said, oh, you were just there, you could have walked out. And again, yes, I could have walked out. But the biggest problem was trying to get between those two locations. And um, so to this day, uh, do I regret that move? Yes, I do. Um, I don't regret it in that, that it took anything away from the reality of what I was doing because the guys, the crew honored my request and they didn't bring any food and they didn't have any water and there was nothing there to tempt me or tease me with sort of thing. Uh, but I just, I just didn't like the interruption. Even seeing them, you know, um, now the, the benefit was I was able to give them all of my camera cards and get fresh batteries and camera cards from them. But other than that, um, I didn't like seeing them there. I didn't like talking to them. You know, even though it was for however long it was, 40 minutes or something, it was, it was an interruption to me and my process. But it was season one. I was not falling prey to what other people wanted to do, but I was definitely open to suggestion, trying to make it work. And I thought, okay, well, I, well, we'll do this. Yeah, you pick me up, then you drop me off. And that's how I ended up in this secondary canyon. So for whoever's watching that did the big, I think I've caught you moment, uh, there, there, there's the story behind the scenes. Basically, yes, I was out actually doing what I was doing. Yes, they didn't clean it up. Then what you didn't know was, yes, I was picked up and moved to here so that I could do this. But did I go back to the road? Of course not. I stayed down and did what I did, and you can see it on film. Uh, but I, didn't, I just didn't like this process. So uh, there's, I'll, I'll get to the other, place, the other place when I do the director's commentary on that episode. But in this situation, that's what happened. So let's carry on, and then I'm going to talk a bit more about having that crew out there because it, they actually, it did become interruptive against my will in a little bit here. It's got to be at least a thousand feet straight down. Okay, now I'm pretty sure that I can find my way down in this canyon. What I'm walking on is a fresh cattle trail. Yeah, that's right, I said cattle trail. They know the way down. There are cattle roaming throughout here, free range. Cattle don't mean salvation, that's for sure. Ow! Okay. Tell you what. Stay the, as dedicated as I am to getting some good shots here, this canyon's getting too steep. I gotta strip down a bit. And, uh, and stop filming. It's too much work going up and down, setting up these cameras. I just gotta get down there. Now, that's one of those moments where the reality of filmmaking kicked in, and you know what? I just gotta get down this, I mean, it was a long ways down and a big, long, massive switchback that, that, switchback that the cattle use, and I'm assuming people use as well. Um, and uh, it's just impossible to film. And sometimes in Survivor Man, it was impossible to film what was going on. Uh, and, and, and this is also, again, figuring, the way, figuring things out in this first season. That, see, the problem with being picked up and dropped off, dropped off here was born out of the fact that I was trying to do something whereby I traveled. And filming yourself while traveling in a survival situation is, is nigh impossible. Uh, very, very difficult work, and uh, which is why after this, I pretty much put the stop to any kind of survival scenario that meant a lot of travel, uh, because it was not because the travel was difficult or the survival was hard, because it was, too, it was too hard to film it when you're by yourself. All right, <clears throat> I'm ready to head down. Take the little camera with me. Maybe I can talk to you on the way. This is when the camera gear really gets heavy. Should have taken my pants off before I walked this. That is where I came from. So 
a long way down. <sighs> I better check this place out. So early in the, in the shooting of Survive Man, season one, the gear was still heavy. Too many batteries, because I couldn't recharge them. So the batteries were the heaviest thing, really. That's what put all the weight on. The cameras were still, uh, you know, I had several of them, so they weigh. Um, I think I was probably still shooting on tape at this point. This is not good news. Let me show you where I just walked. This is my creek down in the valley bottom. Dry as a bone. Your body needs to thermal regulate, and part of that is your cells need to shrink and expand. And if you don't get a drink of water, you can't do that. You can sleep all night in lots of insulation next to the fire and still be cold all the time. Not good news. Now, it was kind of an experiment in editing. Do we put in this stuff? So we did. We liked putting it in. And later on, it would just never be included. But here, we still put that sort of stuff in. I kind of miss it. I kind of missed it a bit because it was instructional, right? Um, and Dave being at the base camp, so where was the base camp? Up at the top, out to the highway down the road, and they were in, I don't know, they're in, a, in a motel, I guess. It's a long way to come and not have water. I'm getting thirsty. My mouth is tasting stale. My head is starting to hurt a bit. I know that's from dehydration. Not drinking enough. I haven't peed in a long time, that's a bad sign. A small patch of snow to keep me going until I can find shelter. I searched a long stretch of this canyon floor for some good shelter. A lot of caves that I thought from a distance looked great. Up close, they're either too high to get to or too small to snuggle into. And most are pack rat dens anyway. This one is facing south and it could keep me warm on sunny days. I think this cave is ready for an extreme makeover. Honestly, one of the cooler shelters and caves that I've ever found in all the years of doing it. Just, I would go back and stay there. It was just kind of cool. I've leveled out the floor inside here. I put up a rock wall and area for a fire on the inside here. Then what I need to do is get a fire going in there and start to warm up the cave very gently, very slowly. So I'm going to stop that here. Think about this for a second. Nobody else was doing anything like this on television at the time. This is long before the other shows that you've seen that are always showing shelters and different things being made. Nobody. And so in many ways, I was a nerd, a complete and total survival nerd. You know, and probably, I guess I still am. Uh, but it was, it was fun. It was exciting to be able to, to show and share survival skills that I've been teaching for years in class and so on and out in the field on television. It was, a, it was kind of a big, kind of a big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. Well, I knew once I got my fire going that I'd probably want a big one just to get some good coals first. So I thought I'd set my fire up in a little flat area there, get a big fire going, and I can transfer some coals over to here and start a small, low fire to help warm up the cave. You gotta be really careful. This is a deadly situation. It wouldn't take much to thermal crack this wall and have a Cadillac-sized rock come crashing down on top of me. That's true, and that's one of my biggest so fears. So I need to heat the cave. Inside a cave is crack, thermal cracking the rock and having it come down and crush me. That's a fear I've never really lost. Very slowly, to keep the rock intact 
and maybe smoke out any pack rats that might be deep inside. You know, everywhere I go to survive, it's pretty intense and pretty special. This place, it's magical here. Not sure. It's the strangest I've ever felt, really. As in this canyon, I mean, I'm just corralled in by it all. And to know that the Anastasi were here and the Paiute and Butch Cassidy and his gang, it's, it's a lot of history here. One of the traditions of the Paiute people were to take this rabbit brush take this plant and uh, they would burn it uh, into the cave on their first burn just to ward off evil spirits and ghosts and such. Seems to me like a good idea. Desert Dave told me that these canyons were the most remote in the southwest and as a result had the densest population of mountain lions. Locals fear coming down here as I have unarmed. One of the uh, Fire rocks just uh, blew up on me. Sent big coals right into my bed and burned my finger trying to clear it out. Oh, it's gonna feel a little strange sleeping in here. I'm sure I'll be thinking about this rock over my head constantly. Oh. some night. I should point out, you know, getting those time lapses meant either staying up late at night for the night stuff or getting up really early in the morning. So I would often have to get up super early, still in the dark, set up the camera, set it on time lapse, go back into my shelter, try to get some more sleep while the time lapse was getting those sunrises. And in season one, I, so I remember now, I have, may have had this crew there. I had Stavros for writing and my, uh, my field producer. I'm not sure if there was a field producer there. Barry Davis, he might have been on this one, and, and David Halliday, and Dave's wife was there. Uh, but I didn't have another shooter. Nobody was getting the beauty shots for me. Uh, I had Glenn Crawford, but um, he wasn't out on the land doing beauty shots. Later on, Max Atwood and uh, uh, Andy Peterson uh, would get me phenomenal beauty shots by going out and filming the wildlife and the sunrises and sunsets and stuff like this. But in season one, I was still doing all of that myself as well, usually, so, well, just while I was trying to film the entire week. Oh, I must have slept better because both my fires went out. The little one up in the cave is out and cold. But this one just has a little tiny bit of residual heat. Maybe I can turn it back into a flame. Remember this guy? Ooh. If I just blow on the ashes, they'll all fly away, and that'll be the end of it. But when I slip this small tube from my bike down through the middle and focus it into the last hot bit of ash, I can gently coax the surrounding charcoal back into red embers once again. This way, I don't use any more of my magnesium stick. Saving resources wherever I can is the survivor's code. <sighs> That's a trick you got to try sometime when you fire. Just let it burn down. If you can just feel a little bit of barely, um, you can sort of barely tell there's some warmth there. You get a, something you can use like a straw and you stick it down. It's pretty cool actually because you can bring the embers right back. Okay, like maybe right now. There we go. Now. I'm going to put these corn chips in, believe it or not. All that effort and a couple of corn chips was worth it. The chips keep the first flames burning well thanks to the oil they're cooked in. I'll show you what I mean about those corn chips. Look. See that? And it holds its flame just like a little tiny candle. So if you don't have much tinder, and you happen to have some corn chips in your pocket, like I did, then it's a great way to help get your fire going. Because that grass went out quick on me. Oh, oh, oh. 
and you probably can transport your flame to wherever you need it. And probably way better than eating them. Or you can eat them. Well, on my trail down into this canyon along the way, I mentioned that I was following a cow trail. So I decided to grab myself not just your ordinary cow patty. Well, okay, it is your ordinary cow patty, but it's got a special job. <sighs> cow patty like that, given that it's a little bit damp, may smolder for as long as a, an hour to an hour and a half, which is a good thing if you want to keep the coals going in your little fire pit and not burn up your wood. Dried dung around the world often from ungulates, uh, hooved animals, often works fantastic as a, uh, a fire keeper. It's already day four, and I haven't had a decent drink of water yet. Well, I've been searching up and down this creek, and all I'm finding is damp sand. Well, it's wet, but it's not wet enough. That's a good one to point out. So you'll see in survival instructional books about just, you know, dig down into the ground and you get to the water table and there's water there. Try doing that without a shovel. And that's the thing that, you know, you, you can't, oh, I'll just, I'll just do this. I hate the I'll just do this in the survival situation. There's no just about it. I mean, even with a shovel. I might not have been able to get down into that particular situation and get down deep. That's hard, hard work. So I think survival books that just show these scenarios, like, oh, you can do this, uh, or, you know, they're not being responsible because you're giving a false impression of how you can survive when the reality uh, is much harsher. So it's better that you focus on uh, methods of survival that are tried and tested and truly work for your scenario, your situation, uh, your experience, where you are. Hunger is nothing compared to a quick approaching death by dehydration. Oh, well, finally, promising. A little touch of water here. This is one little puddle. And by the signs of the, the mouse poop close by, they drank out of it too. So, I wouldn't advise drinking out of a puddle like this with mice around, but I've got to have water. That's the benefit of having something like a straw. Something as simple as a straw ripped off of the bicycle was the most use useful thing I got out of the bike. Uh, because you can use it in situations like this. It'd be really hard to do that without a straw, actually. So that's why you want to repurpose and watch the items that you have in any survival situation. In fact, when you're doing your survival, you know, guys are always going out and doing survival stuff out in the wilderness and that. Try, try testing yourself with different items. Don't just go out and just build a shelter and just do the fire bow. Uh, try, uh, you know, bringing into it cheap survival gear from the store. Uh, the best way you can practice your survival tr uh, methods a lot is actually to limit yourself on what you take out. And that takes some discipline because you know you're going to want to take out a sleeping bag or you want to take out a tarp. You want, yeah, you got you to skim all that stuff down and just say, no, I'm going to take out, I'm just going to walk out with just my clothing. And I don't advise you guys doing this, obviously, without proper instruction and a guide taking you out to do it. But I will say when I was testing myself, I would, do, I would go out with nothing, but I would say I'm going to stop in the, at, at, in Canada, I'd stop at the Canadian Tire Store and I'd go to the uh, shelves and I'd look for something and I'd say, I'm going to spend... $10 on something survival, and I'd buy something survival for 10 bucks or 5 bucks, and I'd take it out with me, see how well it worked in a real situation. Most of the time, not well at all. Oh my gosh. You gotta be really careful entering these canyons. Even the bigger ones too, not just these slot canyons. If there are storm clouds in the air, or if there's been a lot of warm weather like I'm getting, it might melt the snow up on the mountaintops. You could find yourself stuck in the middle with a big wall of water coming at you and no escape. Four days of deadly silence in these canyons. That whole, it's quiet, yeah, too quiet kind of feel. Makes you wonder if even the raven is real. 
Ah, oh, Brother Raven is calling me. I think he wanted to tell me that I was close to something good here. It's nice to have his company. I'm happy, though, because I found some water here. It looks like it's a seepage of water. I don't think I even need a drinking tube for this one. I forgot I found that water. <gasps> I think I was kind of starting to lose it here. The Utah episode was really strange on me, and I think it was really the lack of water more than anything else. Strangely enough, this particular episode was the least amount of water I ever had in all of my survival excursions, and it really did kind of play uh, on my mind quite a bit. I'm glad I found some water. It makes life a little more bearable. It quenches my thirst a lot better than little bits of snow. But I've got to make a real concerted effort at trying to get some food. So I'll stop that there. Now let me tell you the story uh, about one more. I got a couple more stories about the behind the scenes thing with the, with the crew. Again, I want to say the crew was fantastic. They were really great people. David Halliday is my, my consultant and instructor, and his wife was there. Um, and as well, um, Stavro Stavridis, who was the writer, and Glenn Crawford, the cameraman. Um, so let me speak to uh, first the thing that was a, kind of a bit of a letdown that I didn't realize was, you know, Glenn didn't really do a lot of shooting while I was in there. He was, we just figured I'm getting what I need to get, and that's that. And that was when I discovered it could help me a lot if you shot some pictures, some footage of the birds and the bees and the suns, the, su the, the sunsets and the sunrise and stuff like that. And he didn't really, he was just kind of waiting for me to come out to shoot the exit scenes and stuff like that. I think that's the case, or maybe maybe Glenn even left early. I don't remember. It might have been like, well, we don't need you anymore, Glenn. We shot the intro. You can leave now. Uh, the other thing that happened, though, was with Stavros. And a wonderful man, a great writer, but he was there because we all thought Les needs to have a crew, and, and we have to do this all big and pro. and make sure. But the problem with me is you can't write for me. I'm my own writer. Stavros was there to be a writer. And he was trying to put words in my mouth. I'm like, no. And you've never done this, dude. Like, you've never been down living. The, the, the things you're asking me to say and the script you're trying to give me, no. I can't play out a script you've written. I can only do what I'm going to do. And so, I, we, actually, it was a bit tense, if I remember. Now that I'm thinking of it, if I remember correctly, probably a bit tense and a bit argumentative at the time. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't my fault. We just had to try to figure this out. And I just realized really quickly, nobody can write for me. Even when I was doing Discovery Channel uh, Shark Week and, and shows like that, I would just say, don't bring a writer. You know, I write for me. I write for myself. You want me. You want that. What I do, I write for myself. Case in point, uh, uh, we've been, you know, over the years being nominated 27 times for the Canadian Screen Awards, winning three, one for Best Camera and two for Best Writer, which, honestly, I was so thrilled and honored about because that was a nod to my actual craft. And words and writing is something that I always truly loved. Same thing with doing this. Even though I'm just showing you survival stuff, I want to be eloquent. I want to be articulate. And I couldn't, you know, nobody else had ever done anything like what I was doing, so you can't write for me. So I had Glenn Crawford, the awesome cameraman, back there, and maybe he'd already left. Stavros, who was expecting to write for me, who I just didn't need. Because, well, what, you can't come out with me. So... That was that, and, uh, and one more situation coming up with David. So caves are great for people. This guy. But there's a lot of creatures that have set up their living in there that are dangerous yeah. to us. Uh, and they carry black plague or bubonic plague, it's hanta, which kills you a little faster, anaphylactic shock from being bit by uh, the kissing bugs that live on bats and pack rats. The only realistic meal I can catch around here is rat. The Paiute string deadfall is amazing. A simple but deadly bit of ancient technology. It combines cord making methods with leverage and balance principles. Pure physics, really. A stone cold end to unsuspecting prey. See that? 
So here's where I'll point something out. This is probably a deadfall that I'm about to make. This is where, in a survival situation, um, you dip back into uh, more primitive technologies, I was as, as I would call it, uh, which I love. There's bushcraft. I do a whole big talk. In fact, you can check it out. I, one of my podcasts, I think, is my keynote. Uh, is a big talk about the difference between bushcraft skills and primitive technology and pure survival skills. And I think there's a, there's a big difference between those three areas of, of skill sets for being out in the wilderness. Not going to elaborate on it here, but this kind of thing is when you involve the primitive earth skills. Love them. Are you borrowing from other cultures? Absolutely you are. You're learning from other cultures, from around the world, by the way, because there were many techniques that, that actually crossed around the world. You see people over in Indonesia doing the same thing as people in northern British Columbia, and they were never connected. So I love that. I love the primitive earth technology that I was always learning and my chance to bring it into a Survivor Man episode because I would also bring in modern survival skills and I would also bring in bushcrafting, which is something different. Again, the master of that being Morse Kochansky, rest in peace. Uh, so remember that. And if you want to learn more about that, the difference of those three, then check out in the playlists my podcasts and it's my keynote talk at the Bushcraft Symposium. I talk all about the differences of those three types of wilderness skills. Got the rope tied around my little notch here and tied around this guy here too. Oh, I love this. This is, I think this is, is what it is. I'm gonna shut up and let's watch it. Yucca, just a single leaf, I guess, from the yucca plant. Oh, these little fibers sort of just use the yucca as a binding. This is my little bit of energy bar that they so graciously allowed me to have, but let me show you how we can turn this. Well, at least I'm going to hope I can turn this into a lot more substantial food. All I need is a little tiny piece, not much at all, just like just to mush it up. Mm. I, was, I guess it was, I was thinking of when I put my face down into the yucca plant and, plant and pull it out. I guess that was another episode. This little technique here about when you don't have a lot of food to use as your bait for a, a deadfall or snare or what have you. Uh, this was another David Halliday lesson was, you know, take the little bit you have, mush it up in your mouth, and then spit it and rub it onto the trigger because... You've got the food smells on there, and anyway, you don't want to reward them with food. You want them to work at it. You want them to nudge your trigger so they get caught in the trap. Be careful not to eat it. There. Just a little tiny bit. See, I don't want to give these guys food to go away with. Because I've mashed it into the end of this stick, he's going to have to work at that to get it. Now for the hard part. hurting your knuckles is to put a rock underneath it right now so that if it falls, it lands on the rock or tree or what have you. Um, I often just never did that and I paid for it too. I can keep my mind off of hunger by doing something proactive, like building and setting up these traps. Problem is, this activity is all about catching food. Now I'm even hungrier. So that's the Paiute deadfall. Okay. One of my favorite deadfall traps of all time. Love that. See the trigger? You got your top piece, the string, little trigger stick there, which puts pressure on this string, this stick here, and it goes up underneath and just sort of lodges onto the rock. I gotta go make a few more of these. Wish me luck. Another five or six traps should at least better my odds at finally having a meal. This is a nice discovery. That's a big pool of water. It's a good inch frozen on top, though. Cool.
Uh, all right. The inner tube makes for a perfect canteen. Now have a look at what I found. It doesn't really matter where you go. Everywhere on this planet, somebody has been and left behind garbage. Mm-hmm. I wonder if I can find a use for a few of these items. Look at that. Old deer antler. Huh. Old cow skull. This looks very promising. One man's garbage is another man's treasure. This is Mormon tea. It's got ephedra in it, and uh, it can actually give you a nice energy boost. To this day, I love Mormon tea, and whenever I can find it, that's uh, delicious. I've been gone a number of hours, and that cow patty is still red hot and smoldering. Just add dried grass, and I've got fire again. That improves life significantly. Sometimes when I'll run into a situation like that, I will see postings about like, yeah, sure you found it. And I've talked to this before about, you know, the, the, the lighter in, in, in Grenada on the island. So like, yeah, sure, you just found a lighter with fluid. Yeah, I did. And so I've said this story before. And it's the same thing here. It's like, I had no idea I was going to find a fire pit with leftover material. But in a survival situation, that's what you watch out for. You watch out for, you know, uh, stash. Um, I mean, heck, really, you know, one of the, the best things you can do in a survival situation, break and enter into a cabin and survive. Who knows what you'll find? Maybe food, clothing, you never know. So uh, this isn't about purism at all uh, when it comes to keeping yourself alive when you're out there and you don't have food and water. Even have a lid. I spent time cleaning all the rust out of this tin can with the available sand. Eating or drinking any wild plants is extremely dangerous unless you know exactly what you're doing. Cheers. Well, that's a good segue to talk about knowing exactly what you're doing when it comes to wild edible plants. What you could do is you could go and watch my new series, Wild Harvest. So Wild Harvest, brand new series. It's on in Canada on the Cottage Life Channel in the United States on PBS stations presented by American Public Television. So Wild Harvest, 13 episodes season one, 13 episodes season two. Uh, I take you out into uh, forested areas or sometimes the middle of a city. And we find amazing wild edible plants. Chef Paul Rogalski then turns them into just something delicious and amazing in the kitchen. So it's very accessible to you because we just go back into regular places. So sometimes it's out on the land as well. And he can use whatever he wants, salt, sugar, meat, whatever, you know, to add to it. And, uh, and so, for example, we also have, with every season, a new cookbook. So there's Wild Harvest recipes from season one. So, uh, yeah, if you get a chance, or you can watch them right here on this YouTube channel. Just go check the playlist for Les Stroud's Wild Harvest. While I'm at it, while I've got your attention, I might as well mention too that if you've never known this, but when you look at all these different skills that I'm showing you here, and you can see how I love to talk about some of the nuances of them, well, I did write a manual, if you were never familiar with it, called Survive. And I will put this manual page for page up against the SAS Survival Book anytime. Oh, now some of you went, yeah, no way, dude, you know, well, I can't, how arrogant of you, you know. No, I will. I'll put this page for page, page for page up against the SAS Survival Book because the SAS Survival Book has a lot of redundant and unnecessary uh, information in there that's just not applicable to actual survival situations. But with this book, I took the time to make sure, not if you're an expert, if you're an expert, you don't need this. If you're super experienced, you don't need this. But if you're getting into survival, take this with you. You can walk through what's in this book and apply it to wherever you are in a survival situation. And lastly, if you've got kids between the ages of, say, 7 and 12, my new children's book, Wild Outside, I'm up for two awards with this book, uh, two children's choice awards. And this, I, show, I 
teach kids through my adventures, my Survivor Man adventures, and I, sh I give them things they can do out in the wilderness. Um, uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So that's my new children's book called Wild Outside, which is available. These books are available, you know, on my website, the Les lesstroud.ca website, not .com, .ca website. Uh, and yeah, and I've already mentioned that if you want to watch this uninterrupted, just keep going. And again, here's what the playlists look like right there. You see that right there? You click on that, and you, you come to this scroll bar, and there's all the playlists to check out all this stuff. All right, we're back. Mm. Five days without a meal can play on your mind, and this wild tea has got a kick to it. Yeah, I remember that. So often in survival situations, if I went a long time, say three days, four days without much, and then I would ingest something, whether it's a wild tea like this, or I remember, for example, the fish in Alaska, I was jumping afterwards, like or the snake in Georgia. I had so much energy, you know, you can't sleep. You're just like, whoa, your bloodstream's happy, everything's happy in your body, and you, and you just get so full of energy. But this one with the Mormon tea, <laughs> things were getting freaky for me. I guess I was talking to the raven. The solitude, the crazy temperature swings, the long hike down the canyon, it's all taking its toll. Maybe this explains all those grisly canyon legends of lost minds and missing souls, where things get unreal. Now take a look at that. Even that much, you know, that's bark. But that little bit of insulation actually makes a difference. Think of it like sometimes you put a little pillow behind your back when you're sleeping or a blanket on your feet or something. Just that little bit makes a difference. So always trying to find ways to make mattresses and blankets can give you the sleep you need because a lack of sleep is deadly in a survival situation. You see that shot right there? That sun on the rock in the background is so psychologically comforting. It's insane when you're still in the shade early in the morning in a cold survival situation to see the sun on another, in another spot. You're just like, oh, thank God. It's coming. It's coming. And the minute it's finally on your skin, it's just, it's everything in those moments. I, I, I think I can't emphasize enough how inhuman you begin to feel after multiple days sleeping on the ground in a survival situation. You, you start to lose your, do you lose your humanity? You just lose that sense of comfort and calm and you, you have this other sense of you're not yourself anymore. Just another day. Five days without food. Well, I'm in trouble once again. My little puddle that was so fresh and clean is down to, well, I'll drain it out just with this right now. I'm not sure if I say it. I probably am about to say it, but the puddle, the bigger puddle with the ice was a long walk away. So that's why I brought it back in the inner tube of this bicycle tire. But the concept of walking that far every day just to get a drink was going to be pretty taxing on me. I probably mentioned it. And unfortunately, the closest source of water other than this is uh, that one silty puddle. It's fairly deep, but it's a half an hour walk away from here. There you go, half an hour walk away. See these two rocks here? Look, these just didn't happen by chance. These were placed here. They are the perfect fit 
to each other for a Paiute deadfall. Exactly the same type of deadfall that I'm using to try to catch pack rats. Just like this one here, which is one of the five that I have set right now. But guess what? It's sprung. Right, so now let me interrupt this moment here. This is where the problem came in again with the crew. And again, I, want, I, I, I don't mean to diss them at all because over the years of doing this, it's crazy, but you know, if I'd have you know, Barry Clark or Laura or Max or different people, and they would have to drop me off in some crazy location, and they know they're leaving me there for a week. It was like they didn't want to. It's like they were trying to find, well, how can we help you? You don't have to go, th even in the early days, it's like people just didn't want me to go through the pain and the torture of the survival ordeal for the sake of a TV show. So I would not say they were looking for ways to help me to cheat. It was more they were looking for ways to say, come on, let's like, let us help you sum up a bit. And I was just, you know, I mean, I'm no hero, but I definitely was like, no, no, you can't. Like, it doesn't, it won't work. And in this situation here, I had put out five deadfalls. So the problem was, on my way to this, I see somebody. I'm like, what, what the heck? I see somebody. <coughs> well, there are times when I have bumped into, I bumped into a hunter in Arizona, uh, uh, different people, not very often, I think three times or something. But it wasn't, it had happened, so that, oh, okay. Well, it was Dave. And Dave was checking on me. He just wanted to make sure I was okay. So God bless him for that. I mean, he was really just looking out for me, but I was okay. If I wasn't okay, I would have been thrilled, but because I was okay, instead I was ticked. So <laughs> that's kind of, he's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't in a situation like that. Um, but I was like, man, you know, like, hey, of course I was happy to see him, but I was still like, you're interrupting my process. And he's like, oh, Kaboom. Yes, I know. The lighting is much better right now. Sorry, I had to stop for a second and, and just fix that. Uh, so where was I? Dave coming in. You know, he was definitely there. This happened so often. I mean, he was definitely there just for my, my welfare to make sure that I was okay. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a problem. So what he ended up telling me was, oh, you know, my wife and I have gone. We set up a whole bunch more deadfalls for you. And I was just like, ah, oh, Dave, you can't, man. You know, it's just like, you know, I've got mine set out here, and thank you so much. But he was just, again, in the early days of filming Survivor Man, with nothing else out there like, like it, we were compared. It was being compared with people that I was working with to like, well, oh, it's like a cooking show. Let's set you up so you you can do this and this and this and this and this after all these days, on all these days. And I would always say, well, no. Then it's a setup then everything's staged and I'm not really going through anything. And I know exactly what I'm doing. So no, let's not turn it into a cooking show where you know everything is made off camera but ready to go on camera for my experience. <clears throat> and um, that was, a, that was a, a tough one, but I was learning these lessons uh, along the way, especially in season one. And this is where, I, so, so this show taught me, A, I don't need a writer. Nobody can write words for me. B, I can't be picked up and moved halfway through. It's just too interruptive. C, I definitely can't have somebody coming along and helping me in making it like a cooking show. And again, God bless them all, they were really just trying to help and there were no rules for this. So it wasn't like anybody was breaking any rules unless I gave a rule, which I then started giving the more I did more, more shows. So let's pick it up from there and, and see what happens here. Um, I, I, I think, uh, well, we know there's a squirrel caught on this episode. I, just don't, I don't think it's this rock, though. So, I haven't opened it yet. I don't know if I've got a meal, but we're going to find out. Cliffhanger. I haven't opened it yet. I don't know if there's anything here or if I've got a meal, but... We're gonna find out. Now, by the way, I've said this before in director's commentaries, the network executives, the, the dweebs with such little creativity in them at all, the reason why you see these coming up next in shows or before the break 
and then you watch for like 60 freaking seconds stuff you've already seen. You end up seeing the same scene four or five times because they do that. And I hated that. I always disagreed with it because in the end, all you're really doing is saying, we don't have enough content to fill up the time. Let's pad it out with the, here's what just happened, here's what you're going to see, and here's what just happened. It's, to me, that's, um, that is, um, well, in the words of Ryan Reynolds, that's just lazy writing. In this case, it's just lazy filming. So I refuse to do it, other than maybe a quick little half sentence like this. Nothing. With every failed trap, my hunger grows. So dramatic. I actually expected to find something under these traps, but they're not even knocked down at all. I'm just going to knock this one just to show you just how effective uh, they can be. One last trap to check. I think it's down. Let's go find out. No need for big fanfare this time because the first one had nothing, so. Whoa. Well, what do you know? I'll show you with this guy here. You know what was crazy about the fact that Dave and his wife had set up other traps? They caught squirrels. They actually did catch them. And I'm just like, which I found out later. They told us, yeah, we caught a bunch. I'm like, oh, well, would have enjoyed them, but again, couldn't bring them into the episode because it just, it's just you know, it was wrong on too many levels. I think it's a type of a ground squirrel. I'm going to call it dinner. Remember the spokes from the bike? This skewer will put distance between myself and the squirrel. The plague is still a very real possibility down here. Time to go shopping. And that's not really a, a drama. You know, that, that was information I was given. I, you know, Dave would say, yeah, no, people do still end up at the hospital with the, with the uh, aversion of the plague as, a, as, a, as an infection or whatever it is. I don't know if it's a virus or infection or what it is. Uh, and so, and, and a lot of hunters and trappers know this too. It's important to be careful with uh, your game as you catch it uh, because, well, ticks for one thing. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, you're messing with a dead biological creature. Depending on how long it's been sitting out, for example, uh, you want to be very clean about it and careful. Mm, ground squirrel. I'm going to need to cook this guy really well. So I'm going to get him on the fire now. Let him cook for a good long time. Once again, I've been able to use the piece off the bike. It's going to help me cook this little fella. Just use the brake cable, hook in through his head there. And now I'm just going to let him cook good and slow. What I'm going to do is singe all of the hair off and cook him very well, just in his own case like that, just to make sure everything is, in terms of diseases and parasites, has been taken care of. That's one thing you can't get often in a survival situation out in the wilderness. There's plastic, metal, glass. So when you are repurposing something for a survival situation, that stuff is gold, basically. And so here was, you know, cabling from the bike, brake cable. Works perfect as a way of uh, roasting this squirrel over a fire. Now look, I don't like to kill anything at all. But this shows you that with a little bit of ingenuity and determination, you can get yourself a meal if you truly are lost and need to survive. I took so much flack for that, just saying that one comment, I don't like to kill anything at all. Why? It's true. I don't. Now I'm a human being. I kill to live. We all do. Even the vegans are killing plants to live. Get over that. So I just like to say it because I love all wildlife and I love all living, living species and sentient beings. Uh, but I'm also aware of the fact that uh, I'm omnivorous uh, myself, so something's going to die if I'm going to live. And uh, the point of this is not to be sensational about a deadfall trap, uh, and, and uh, it's actually just called a deadfall. There are traps, snares, and deadfalls. Uh, and getting the squirrel is to say to you, hey, if you're in a desperate situation, this is possible. A better situation would be to have a, a, a gun and to hunt a deer and then live for a half a year 
That would be a better situation. But in a tough situation, a ground squirrel is food. All of this camera work combined with actual survival makes hunting and gathering any food at all vital to my ability to carry on. Hang on. Somebody's calling me. Hello? Oh, oh, it's FaceTime. That was right in my ear. And we're back. This is for Luke. There we go. The reason we do that, by the way, <coughs> it's called a slate. All right? You see it all the time. A lot of times you'll put information here, so it's for different information when you uh, uh, are filming. Uh, but filmmakers know what I'm talking about, so they're just going to go, yeah, whatever. But the reality is the reason why that happens in a situation like this is when you have multiple cameras. There's one. There's two. Uh, you could have three or four more. Uh, in the edit suite, and there's software ways of doing this now. It's no big deal. But in the edit suite, that sound, that <laughs> spikes on the waveform that you see on the screen. And so you can line all those spikes up, press go, and all the cameras, so you get a perfect image that's matched camera to camera. So I can go like this, or like that, or like this, or like that, or like this. And that's all connected together. That's why you see people doing camera slates before shooting film. Uh, as I said, also there's often information on them. They even have them digitally now. All right, let's keep going because my batteries are going to probably die on me again. So here we go. Now these juniper berries, while they do taste absolutely horrible, eating a couple of them will help to, uh, because of the chemicals in them, it will help to prepare my stomach for eating meat, make it easier to digest. You know, a lot of archaeology is, oh, I can just hear the squirrel sizzling over there. A lot of archaeology is based on uh, what they find in terms of stone tools, rock tools, things that are chipped into other things. And uh, the Paiute around here and the Anastasi were both terrific at what's called flint napping. This is a piece of rock just from laying around in this area. And uh, this is a hammer rock, which is an actual artifact from this area just laying on the ground. You can see the chipped end. It was used for turning big pieces of rock into little pieces of rock, into knife points, arrowheads, and spear tips, and those kinds of things. That's really what flint napping is, so I'll see if I can use it. So once again, this is that whole thing where I'm bringing in primitive earth technology into a survival situation, which I just love to do. So different than ripping apart a bike and using a piece of metal is doing something that goes back thousands and thousands of years. I mean, flint napping goes back tens of thousands of years. It's, it's such an amazing, beautiful skill. David Halliday makes beautiful uh, knife points and, and arrowheads. And he would say that there are, he has other people that he admires that make even more beautiful. People, it's, it's an art form, really. I suck at it. I can make what I need to put it, make an arrowhead and make an arrow and hunt game, but it's not going to be pretty, which to me is just fine. And I just said, which to me is just fine. And I lost the battery again. Sorry, Luke. Aha! Success. See that? That little guy is very, very sharp. And that's really the whole point. It's not, to know flint napping is not to know how to make a beautiful knife uh, or an arrowhead or a spear tip. It's to know how to make a sharp edge to use it in a survival situation. That's where I came from. it Because I'm not an artist. I'm not good with my hands that way in terms of crafting things. Uh, I'm visual. I'm word. I'm sound oriented. Uh, so I just wanted a sharp edge since, you know, it just, it's a way to, to be in a survival situation, to, if you don't have a knife, I actually had, of course, my multi-tool. I could have used that, I suppose. But this was a cool thing to show. So here we go. Let's watch this. This thing is so sharp, it just cuts right through. He's definitely not cooked through yet. Flip over, use the other side of this flake, because I'm going back up the top again. Ha! 
And I'm sorry if this looks disgusting, but it's no different than a chicken or a pig or a turkey or anything else. I'm not satisfied that he is cooked all the way through yet. So... I'll need to cook it right through to make sure any parasites are dead. Which is not always the case. There are sometimes, you know, different, like fish, for example. I would eat fish raw. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, everything's nicer when it's cooked. But you lose, you lose uh, um, nutrients when you cook things. But in this case, I just did not want to ingest any bad bacteria from this, this rat. So, it, you know, you're going for the well-done phase, basically, just to, just to try to kill everything, which is it's a better way to do it. As I think about it, I probably should have just boiled the rat in that big tin. Oh. Oops, my squirrel's burning. Of all the gross things I've eaten in survival situations, surprisingly, I didn't get sick from this squirrel at all. There was no problems afterwards. Dinner. Oh. <sighs> Whoa. It's pretty charred on the outside, but so it should be. Ugh. Well, what I'm not going to eat is the entrails, being, being the uh, intestines and such. But uh, you know, the heart, the kidney, the liver, all good stuff to eat. There's my meal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save all the bones and I'm going to cook them even more. I'm going to have them for breakfast. Good bout of calcium. So inside here, I've got, yeah, there's the, uh, looks to be the heart. Nope. That's the liver. There's my squirrel. <laughs> Good. Well, tonight, for a little extra warmth, I'm going to use hot rocks. I'm just taking these rocks. I got four like this, and I'm just putting them in close to the fire. Get good and hot. I'm going to tuck these in like this as I sleep, and they'll keep me warm, good and warm, for quite a long time. I've got four, and I'll just rotate two. Two heating up. Two on my body, two heating up, two on my body. Pay attention to that skill, because that skill is a lifesaver. And if you're camping with your kids, put hot water in one of your Nalgene bottles, put that in their sleeping bag with them. It's amazing how warm it makes you. And that's really all you're doing is it's, with this situation, it's a hot rock situation. Uh, that heating up rocks and sleeping with them, I have been known to hug them all night long. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's a great little trick in, in any kind of cold weather survival situation, almost any night, really, because that's the other reality. People think that, oh, you know, it can be pretty warm on certain summer nights. It's always chilly in the middle of the night, even on a hot August night, even down south. The middle of the night, if you just go outside and just lay there, you get chilled. Sure, if you're in side in your bed, you go, oh, it was a sweltering night, I was laying on top of my sheets, I was sweating all night. That's fine, you're in your house. It's still different out in the wild. And anybody who does any time camping can tell you, even on the hot, hot, hot summer days, at night, at 3.30 a.m., it's chilly. So, the hot rock method is a very cool little survival trick that I've used for 25 years now. This water is still a big problem, though. It's a long way to get it. Breakfast. True though, in a survival situation, eating bones. You eat the bones, you get that calcium, you get the min minerals that are associated with bones. C you know, cook them up, roast them, crush them, 
put them in a hot drink, whatever it takes, you eat everything. The, thing, the only thing I usually throw out in a survival situation when it comes to game are the entrails. So, you know, what's been digested and is about to be pooped out, that stuff, sure, that's, that's gone. Even in grasshoppers, I pull, the, I pull those out. Um, and with grasshoppers, you just grab the head and you pop it off and they all come out. I think I showed that in the Arizona episode. It's very cool. But, uh, but the bones, fair game and good for you. Oh, if anything will get you up in the morning, it's chewing on some cold squirrel bones. That was a cold night. I think other than you sweat, you die, this episode has been quoted by people more than any other with things like, oh, my squirrel's burning. You know, I'm just not sure what the toughest part is, the constant search for water or this huge fluctuation between very hot days and bitterly cold nights. I don't think I could do another night like this, though. The food made me even thirstier, but at least cleared my mind. Maybe these canyons have beaten me. The outlaws used to lure lawmen in here to starve them out, and they called it box death. Film or no film, I need more water to survive. All right. You know what? I'm not gonna do another day. It's gonna take me all day just to hike out of this canyon, climb all the way back up. I'm getting out of here now. And that 48 kilometers, we did actually figure out, we figured with, as far as where I traveled, where I did hike and everything, and all the walking back and forth, and that added up. Uh, but this situation, this is the only time that I felt justified in leaving early. It was day six. It was, it was on the sixth day, so I would have been out the, the next morning anyway. And it, it was basically dehydration. You know, people, you know, what's the toughest thing that gets to you? You know, hypothermia, dehydration, heat stroke. Not being attacked by a jaguar in the Amazon jungle or a tiger in India. It's, it's those, those slow killers. And this had now been, well, I guess this was the sixth day, sixth day of just, you know, sucking from some of those puddles and that. And the hike to that one puddle I found was just, it would have meant that, you know, a lot of my days with lethargy kicking in would have been based on just going to that puddle and drinking and coming back again, which wasn't much to film, basically. So that's why on this time, the one and only time in 20 years of making Survivor Man, uh, I decided myself, I'm, I'm going out now, because I was starting to get migraine headaches and, uh, and just not thinking right, you know? Sometimes survival is knowing when to get out alive while you still can. Ah, that's a bit much. Well, of course I had to come back from the camera. What'd you think? So now begins my long climb up out of the canyon. And you know what? This time, I'm making the crew come back and pick up this camera. See you next time. And this was true. So this time I actually, I wanted to shoot my, my journey all the way up that long trail up and out of this canyon. And uh, so, I did leave my camera down there, which is how I ended up getting myself in this whole predicament is that I said, well, you guys got to go back down and get the camera for me. I can't do it. And, and they were all fit. They could do it. So they went down to get the camera. I just let it burn itself out as I walked away because I didn't want to come back down and get it and go up again. I, I, just, I, was, I just didn't have the energy for it. Uh, but that's when they were supposed to go and clean up the second shelter under the cave, that cave area. They were supposed to go and break that down and disperse it. And, uh, well, they didn't. And so then when someone sort of figured out where I was and which canyon and everything, and yeah, I, again, there was a road if I climb up and out and go out, there was a road I could eventually get to. Uh, but that's how somebody figured out, and I guess they were down there hiking, and they saw my stuff in the cave. And they're like, oh, you're leaving your crap behind. They were right, but I didn't know that at the time. And as I said, I don't think I really figured that out until I saw that posting. 
And uh, and I talked. I was like, yeah, no, we didn't. You know, I talked to my guys. I was like, we didn't. We didn't get a chance to go. I was like, come on, man. And I was like, they were supposed to go. So not pointing fingers, but it was just sort of a missed. It was a drop ball. We'll call it a drop ball. Um, uh, but other than that, so I have worried about that in other episodes. For example, in the Arctic with my snowmobile, which they finally went and got and pulled that out. And then the car in Norway. You know the car in Norway? That car was left there for another whole year before some friends of mine went in and got it out of there. So it sat out there for another whole year and because they, they knew they had to tow it out. It wouldn't drive. So they had to tow it out and it took a long time. But so, you know, I could kind of end that with what are you going to do? And there we go. So let's see, see who's on this. Uh, Dave Brady, Richard Mandon, good editor. So there it is, Stavros Stavridis. Great man, great writer, excellent filmmaker. <coughs> and he was with me on this with the idea. It was Dave Brady who really wanted him, badly wanted him with me. He said, no, you need this guy. He's a great writer. And in the end, like I said, we argued a bit at first, uh, but the bottom line was, was like, well, everything you've written, I can't, I can't say, I, and I won't say. It's not me. And, and that's when I realized in this show that, you know, I write for myself. And so in 30 years of filmmaking, I have always written for myself. If I go do Shark Week and they give me a big script, I just rewrite the whole thing. And I'll tell, I'll, you know, if I get hired or booked to be, you know, uh, a host of something like that, I will often say, Okay, but I'm warning right now. Let me do. Let me do my own writing. Depending on what it is, if it's certainly very, if it's technical of something that I have to repeat, great. But for the most part, how are you going to put a writer on Survivor Man when the guy's out there by himself surviving? It really didn't make sense. But I lost that art. It was still early in the days. I was still losing some arguments back in the offices before I would leave, and I lost that argument. Okay, we'll bring Stavros Stavridis along. Um, nice guy, but. Didn't work. Glenn Crawford was the cameraman. Amazing, wonderful man. His daughter, uh, I, I won't get her name right, Chandra, I think. Olympic, I think she was an Olympic gold medalist uh, in skiing. I don't know which, it uh, may have been cross country, could have been, I, I think it was cross country racing. Um, and uh, sorry, Glenn. But anyway, wonderful family, wonderful people. And his daughter was an Olympic, uh, Olympic champion. Uh, so, and then the music in season one was Peter Cleish and Dan Columbia out of North Bay, Ontario, uh, doing amazing music for me. Yeah. That created by Les Stroud thing was important for me to put in. You did, I did learn along the way, little things you had to do to establish your legal uh, strength in scenarios and putting created by is a calculated legal thing to do because later you could find yourself in some court going no that's my work that's my I, that's my intellectual property look created by it's lived on air around the world with that there establishing my ownership it's crazy that business has to seep into art i do hate that but it does Okay, and that one says copyright 2005. That's actually probably wrong. That should say 2004 when it was released. Filmed in three, released in four. It doesn't matter. All right, there we go. I finally got through. I've stopped a number of times because of batteries quitting on me, but otherwise, there we are. That is the Utah Canyon lands. Hopefully, I've addressed the conspiracy of what was going on. Bottom line being, that was the one and only time, not the one and only, it was one of the only two times when I, enab I allowed myself to be moved and I said, never again, it doesn't work. I don't want to see anybody midweek, whether it's giving them batteries or cards or being me being moved a few miles, doesn't work. I didn't like it. But I was still new to it. We were trying different things. So as I said, guys, I'm going to go, I'm going to do another director's commentary uh, very soon and I'm going to keep these things coming for you. Uh, but remember, if you've got a kid, 7 to 12-year-old, brand new children's book, Wild Outside, don't forget that. Many of you are already logging off right now. You're not watching this, but Wild Harvest, my new series. There's the recipe book. DVD's available. Watch these all online. And uh, that's it. Until next time, we'll talk to you again soon.